welcome to this evening's presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce Grant Whitford, who's going to be talking to us this evening about his 11 years search for the star. Welcome, Grant. Hi, thanks. I'd like to firstly thank uh, OMSEC for inviting me to, to do this uh, presentation because it's been um, quite a few years since we found the star and I've been meaning to do this and just never got around to it. And eventually they said, why don't you do something like this and kick my, my butt into gear and here we are. So thanks to OMSAC. We've also got a bit of a live studio audience here. Some guys have come uh, from Somerset West and some of the previous star divers, Ian, Olivia, Jenny and Adrian. Thanks guys for being here. I think it's much nicer if, we, if we've got a, a bit of a group here. So let's, um, let's kick it off. I'm going to try and keep this um, as brief as possible. We don't want to go on all night. Okay. Um, so the Star of Africa. Let's have, the, let's have the next slide. Just to show you where we are in the world. Um, the peninsula. And you've got albatross rocks over here. And for anything coming along the coast, you can see that there are kind of two points, Hook van Bobbejaan and, and Uli van Spoor's Punt. And anything coasting is going to come right past there. Hook van Bobbejaan doesn't have any offshore rocks, but right over there, that's, that's the albatross rock over there. And that has claimed numerous uh, shipwrecks. And uh, that's why it's like a shipwreck, uh, shipwreck diver's uh, place to be. Um, while we're looking at the map, just the problem with diving there is that it's a long way from launching sites. You do have a little slipway over here at um, the crayfish factory, um, but that you can only dive, you can only really launch a, a big boat at, at high tide. And you also want to dive at high tide. And you also want to take the boat out at high tide. And it's just not that much high tide. So that's a bit of a problem. The only other place you can really go from is also um, Komiki over there. A uh, similar sort of situation there with the tide, it's also a little bit difficult. So really a lot of our dives we did from all the way from Heart Bay. So the problems you've got here, firstly it's a long way from, from anywhere where you can put a boat in. And secondly, it's quite exposed to the southwest swells. Our, our swells are coming right in here. There's not much protection from the, from the southeast. So it's a really exposed spot. So you can, we find you, you've probably got about um, 10, maybe 20 days in the year that you can dive there. And of the days that coincide with the weekend, when you can get a group together, you're looking at maybe, you know, three or four days. And, you know, people aren't available and so on. And that's why it's just difficult diving there. But anyway, we like it. Okay, let's have a look at the, the next slide. This is the, the, around Albatross Rocks, there are, uh, numerous wrecks. I think we've got six here. These are the six wrecks which are actually on the rocks. There are others that, there's some that hit the rock and went somewhere else and ones that were beached a little bit further away. But these six uh, are, are the really the ones that we're concerned about when we're diving there. So firstly, uh, these are in chronological order. So firstly we had the Alouette in 1817. She was a French ship struck the rock and ended up uh, ended up on the shore one child drowned and she had uh, quite a mixed cargo she was going from france to reunion which was then the french colony um, and it, actually at that time there was a lot a lot of french shipping around the point and uh, there are another two french ships which are in the area okay after the alouette came this the this is Albatross, she was a steam tug, and she hit the rock and then was uh, sank in 12 minutes, also went inshore a little bit. And then, of course, that's where the, the name of the rocks came from, is from that, uh, that ship. Uh, then, 1880, the one we were worried about, the Star of Africa. And we'll go into a bit of uh, more detail with her, but basically she was a Aberdeen-built uh, three mastered iron bark and 431 tons. Captain Barron was her captain. She struck the rock and sank shortly afterwards. That's quite important. Shortly afterwards, 
sailing from south to north, going towards Cape Town with her cargo. Okay, then after her came the Mshlali uh, in 1909, same year that the Maori wrecked. We all know the Maori. And she's actually very similar to the Maori. If you look at that picture of her, you can see so very similar steamship to the Maori. And she had a general cargo, and she's one of the better dives at, at Albatross Rocks. And then 1917 came the beer, actually also very similar to, to the Maori and the Mshlali. It's a Swedish freighter, same tonnage almost exactly as the Mshlali. And she was beached after hitting the rock. Four men died there. And then Second World War came the steamship, the Thomas T. Tucker. She was uh, an American Liberty ship, quite a lot bigger, 7,200 tons. Also struck the, struck the rock and ended up on the, on the in, in, in shore. So uh, she had a, a cargo of um, war materials. She was going to the Persian Gulf or something from America, a maiden voyage. And uh, most of that was tanks and stuff they managed to, to get off of her. Okay, so those are the six wrecks that we're talking about. Let's have the, the next slide. Star of Africa, obviously the main one. The others, we all knew kind of where they were. We figured it out as we were diving in the area. Now, um, this is not the Star of Africa. This is a three-masted iron bark of the same, built in the same uh, period and the same length and tonnage. So this is just for reference. There are, unfortunately, no pictures of the Star of Africa that I could ever find. No photographs. Um, I, I, she just seems to have never been photographed. Um, but if you, the thing to that, that this photograph points out is firstly the huge uh, bowsprit. That's massive. And also look how tall those masts are. You know, and uh, we'll, we'll read in a second about why that's important. But these are the top sails. Top sails up there and royals over here. So we'll see why that's important in a minute. Okay, let's go. Next slide. Okay, so there's a book by Lawrence Green. Lawrence Green was a um, historian, writer, sort of um, guy. He wrote in a lot of his books about shipwrecks and a whole lot of other <laughs> rubbish. A lot of it's quite... Uh, far off the point and, and not very accurate. But still, in his book, Almost Forgotten, Never Told, this one, this is what he says about the Star of Africa, and this is where we start to get information about where we would start to look and so on. Okay, he says, uh, early hours of August morning, she floundered and sank almost immediately. There it is again. The wind was light and she was under royals, those sails that I pointed out. Uh, this is from the first trick which aroused interest in the treasure hunters because, uh, uh, anyway, perilous diving conditions. We know what about that. It's generally shallow and a lot of, you know, very exposed there. And um, anyway, it talks about he'll, you know, fill you in on whatever he's been able to discover. And a bit of the story about the captain, Captain Barrow, who is the part owner of the ship and was returning to Table Bay from Calcutta with a general cargo of Eastern merchandise. Ship was valued at 9,000 pounds, cargo similar amount. Let's have a look at the next slide. Um, so we find out that he, the captain, was married and that his wife was on board, that he had uh, supervised the fitting out of the ship in Aberdeen and had made the cabin suitable to have his, his wife with him. It was quite nice. And the main cargo is, is rice, but there's other stuff. There's castor oil, um, coconut oil, casks of tamarinds. I'm not sure what they are. Um, other stuff. And a box of golden sovereigns, possibly coin, because in those days the um, cargoes were paid for in gold. And he apparently was saving for possibly to buy a steamship with his partners in Cape Town. So you would think there was um, there was possibly quite a lot, a lot of gold coins in his strong box or safe in his cabin. Um, 
a little bit of when they when they struck the rock it was at night and the ship went down almost immediately but obviously people were woken up he's shouting to somebody for god's sake save my wife but it was impossible to do so henderson which is the the first mate was drawn down by the suction but he came up again and managed to cling to a capsized rope a capsized boat with uh, five other uh, seamen four of them dropped off and drowned uh, before they drifted the boat drifted ashore six hours after that henderson and francis one of the seamen crawled ashore onto the beach so there was uh, two survivors of the crew of 16 so 14 14 perished uh, he talks about Mr. Alexander Black of Simonstown having bought the wreck for 72 pounds only, which seems very little, and some of the cargo was washed up on, on the beach. Um, okay, so he also talks about how uh, Cape Town, this ship was the main supplier of rice to Cape Town, and after her sinking, uh, Cape Town ran out of rice. And the price of rice went up, and, and the Malay people, who were mostly, I think, eating the rice, had a bit of a dry time with the rice. So all this sort of information comes from newspaper articles, which I've got here. So one can go to the Cape, uh, Cape Town archives, and you can look on the days that all this stuff happened, and you can find from the Cape Times, and uh that's cape times uh, the various ones here you can get a whole lot of information you can get the names of the other uh, crew that died and some interesting and odd stuff around the the cargo and you know what it meant to cape town to lose this essentially a cape town ship then uh let's go to the next slide <laughs> Uh, no, there must be one before that. Okay, here we go. So, in another little interesting aside, um, um, Lawrence Green talks about a diver that he interviewed. So, this was a guy called Carl Erickson. Erickson was a diver working in Cape Town from about that period until I think just before the First World War. So, that was hard hat diving, the old days of hard hat diving. I mean, they were pretty you know rudimentary equipment and so on. so this is what the guy says they got out there they must have got there when the, sh the mast was still sticking out the water and he says the exposed position the hull of the ship was full of sharks man-eating sharks they were packed in there like sardines in a box i counted 16 big ones then i signaled that i was coming up for dynamite but then the wind started to blow and we had to pack up. And he said, the syndicate, which would have funded this expedition, collapsed. I never went down again. No one else would risk his life at Albatross Rock, but there's gold and other treasure aboard the old Star of Africa. That syndicate knew all about it. So that's like, you know, man-eating sharks packed in there like sardines and <laughs> going up for the dynamite. You don't know what this guy was you know, he was being interviewed by Lawrence Green, and this is what it came up with. But probably they got there a day or two after the sinking. Uh, maybe the owner, uh, Black, had, had chartered them, obviously to get to the, um, the strong room. But we now know with the sort of depth where she was lying and the, the sort of equipment they were using, uh, you know, and, and being in an exposed position. I mean, they must have just got there. There's no weather forecasting or... You know, I think it's it's unlikely that they could have really achieved anything. Anyway, that's just a bit of an aside. Let's go for the next slide. Okay, so this is Albatross Rocks. This is the, the point here, Willie Fons Boys Pint. And on the shore, you've got the Thomas T. Tucker, some wreckage, bits of uh, machinery that have, that have washed right up onto the shore. And this is kind of when we started going there, this is with um, when I was still running Pisces dive charters with Mike Nokia, like uh, 2004, I think. That's the extent of what we knew of Albatross Rock. So here you've got the main rock, 
Uh, and there's another rock just a little bit inshore. I think it's called Elephant Rock, but I'm not sure about that. But this is the guy that claims all the, all the shipping. It's a fair distance offshore. And it's Kelpie. This is all Kelp. These little symbols here are Kelp. So that's as it looked when we got there the first time. Pisces dive chart is going to go and find, you know, dive this area. Okay, next slide. Right, so um, after diving there four or five times, we got to find that the Umschlali, kind of in this area, the Thomas T. Tucker, a little bit over here to the east, and the beer, I don't think we talked about the beer when we had the list of ships. Anyway, she's there. She's the, the freighter in two parts. We could never really establish which was the Alouette. The Alouette would have been a wooden ship, a sailing ship. So I think she's kind of over here, but we're not sure. Now these dives are shallow. You're talking about five, maybe six meters. And normally because you're they're so exposed to the shell, uh, the swell, they're also very surgy. Uh, so these wrecks are completely broken up. You can't even, uh, you know, you might see something and think, oh, that's a piece of that machinery or that must be main engine. But then you swim over there and that doesn't make sense. Maybe that's from another wreck. It's all mixed up and very difficult to, um, to sort of discern what's going on down there. Interesting stuff to find though. Uh, especially on the Mshlali. Um My whole thing with the Mshlali was the cod bottles, but that's a whole different story, those glass bottles with the marble stopper. And um, But I got into a bit of the history of that and how that those bottles would have been coming to South Africa from the UK. Um, anyway, that's a different bit of history there. Um, so that's what, we, that's what we found after a few dives there. I think four or five dives and quite quite nice going there on nice days whenever we could. Then we get to thinking about the Star of Africa. Where could she be? So Lawrence Green talks about the when she sank in the the following day that the uh, the top sails or the no, the royals were sticking out of the water. If you look at the the that picture of the ship, you kind of how deep would that have been? Where would she have uh, how deep was she? And it kind of equates to about 20, maybe 25 meters. But all these wrecks have been moved well inshore. I mean, this stuff of the Thomas T. Tucker, this is heavy stuff, many, many tons. And it all gets moved that way by the swell. So we figured she wouldn't be as deep as that. She, that, you know, it's only a 400 ton ship. When you've got our big winter swells, everything moves up onto the beach. So, you know, she struck the rock, she was going north, sank almost immediately. So, you know, we're thinking maybe over here somewhere and, and the swell would have pushed us and maybe kind of over here. Okay, so we're going to start searching. Off we go. Next slide. So the first thing we did is the rock is we dropped some divers. I think we've got uh, eight, eight divers and just do a circular search. You know, this is kind of the area where we think she's going to be. This is the 10 meter contour, by the way. So this is still pretty shallow. Out here, you've maybe got about 15 meters. Do a circular search and let's hope for the best. Found nothing. So, you know, that would be the first dive of the day. Then you go and dive them slowly or whatever. Next time there. Okay, so now we rig it. This circular searching doesn't really work in kelp and in the shallows. It actually is much better to, um, to swim a line. So we figured that the way to do it is to drop divers like that and you just swim magnetic um, east. And then I take the point where the diver goes in the water and I take the point where the diver comes out of the water and I join the line and we consider that to be kind of area covered. Now it's a bit Im it's a bit imprecise, but what can you do? That's that seems to be the best way we thought of, of finding it. So those first uh, five lines 
Oh, obviously somebody went a bit skewed, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, found nothing. Next time. Bear in mind, these dives are, you know, probably six months, maybe a year apart. So we're going to go from here and extend our search a bit to the north. And so we drop in there those four four positions. I think this time we were, we were swimming in buddy pairs. Sometimes the divers would go solo and head up magnetic north. There is the size, you know, for this chart. That's the size of that the ship would be. So it's quite possible she could be in between one of the lines and you'd miss her. But with wreckage scattered and so on, you'd think that sort of distance, that size ship, you'd probably, you'd probably come across something. And so it was. Whoever number one was swam up. Uh, it was, I remember it was Jenny was one of the divers on that dive. I don't know who your buddy was. And pops up over here with a piece of what looked like angle iron, like a big rusty piece of iron. And that's like the first metal we've found anywhere here. So, okay, there must be something there. So I decided let's put all four of those divers back in the water and we do like a protruding outward search and they found nothing. So that area is basically covered. So nothing found, go back to them slowly and do a shallow dive. Next time we're going to try and go up here uh, also four lines going up that way. This long one would have been Peter Southard because he always swims a long way and mm -hmm. whoever that was went a bit skew but you know that's how it kind of goes. Uh, so that was the area covered but found nothing. Um, looking at one uh, another of Lawrence Green's books he talks about the, the wreck being quite far from the rock. He says three quarters of a mile of a nautical mile and that's up there. So that I always thought that's uh, unlikely when the account says she sank immediately. How you know that that's a long way to just drift. Okay, so and the wind was light, so she couldn't have even if the wind was from the southeast. Ah, I thought no, oh, that's you know that's too far north. But anyway, we're we're getting up there. So let's drop in. We dropped in here this time. We had uh, what's that? Seven divers. And the lines were nice and straight. Well, I kind of think so because I took the start and end points and that's kind of how it worked out. But we found nothing. Okay, let's go the next time. So I've been talking to Gary Mills. Gary Mills, old Cape Town wreck diver and sal salver. And he said no, he knew where the star was. He'd had a, a mag search done by Jean Tresfon. And he described, I went to see him and he described what he'd found, what, what he thought was the star. And it was the same, the description he had was in shallow water, it was like five, six meters. And there was a rudder post and this, that, and other thing. And we found a wreck over here, which matched what he said what he thought was the star. But to me, it didn't make sense that that was the star. So I thought, well, let me find out about this mag magnetometer search that Jean Tresfond did uh, and see where they were. I went to Jean. Jean obviously wouldn't give me the mag hits because he'd been charted by Gary and, and another guy, Terry McCann, to do that search. But he said, you know, he'd give me the area where they searched to help me further further refine my search. And this is the, that block. That's what they covered. So we're kind of in the right area. We were obviously thinking the same along the same lines. It goes up past the, the three quarters of a mile and yeah, we're, we're in the right area. Um, but obviously we've got gaps. Yeah? There's quite a bit of gap here, there's a gap there. To the north we're not seeing much. Here it's getting a bit shallow. You know, That's like 12 meters. I don't think she's that shallow. So let's go on, let's do another, another dive. So we came back, we're now further in the north, um, and that's another five lines swimming, um, swimming east, and again, we found nothing. But I really, you know, starting, starting to lose hope a little bit. We've now swum this place, frack, <laughs> where could she be? So 
we're kind of losing a bit of hope. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what are we doing here? Let's rather just dive the wrecks that we know and forget about the star. Um, you know, what? It doesn't matter. Anyway, we decided let's give it one more go, one more dive. And what we'll do is we'll cover that little spot that was missing. And there was a little area here to the to the west of the where that wreckage was. And so that came up clear. Number two came up clear. Number three came up clear. So the very last spot, number four, guy was going in there, swimming that way. It was Matthew and somebody else who we're not sure. Matthew and and Olivia. Okay. Drops down, comes straight up and says, well, we found it. That's the spot. <laughs> so that was the last dive of all those dives that we were ever going to do looking for the star. We found it. So that block over there is, next slide, is what we found that block relates. Um, and this is the scattered wreckage. Very broken up, as we would have expected. Um, and pretty deep, about 25, 26 meters, uh, sometimes 27. Maybe it explains a little bit why she wasn't set inshore. There's a bit of a shallow patch up here. So with a southwest swell, maybe she was in a bit of a depression and couldn't be, couldn't be pushed up that way. Um, okay, let's go for the, the next. So now how do we know that we found the right ship? Um, firstly, we were looking at, this isn't a very good photo, but these are dead eyes, what they call a triple dead eye, which is in the rigging of sailing ships. We knew she was a sailing ship and she was iron. So that's clue number one. Next slide. That is the, a dead eye from the star, a triple dead eye. So none of the other ships in that area were sailing ships that would have had those. So that's clue number one. And number two, iron plates. These are clearly riveted, riveted iron plates that were all over the wreck site. So the, um, you know, she's iron, she's a sailing ship. The length of the wreckage generally matched. I'm 99.9% .9 sure we found the star. Okay. So this is a team of guys that, um, that found her on that happy day. <laughs> uh, all looking very, very chuffed with ourselves. This was actually at the Crayfish Factory, one of the days that we, we launched there. Okay, next one. Um, we went back uh, a while later to do the, the, the next dive after finding her and just to have a, a much better look around and take some photographs. But I thought, you know, first thing you do is pay, pay some reverence to the, to the people that drowned there. So we had some flowers. I tried to get a Scottish uh, Captain Barrow was a Scotsman, but uh, we couldn't get <laughs> we couldn't get anything that would be appropriate, so we just used our local flowers. And I said a few words and uh, put the flowers in the water and had a um, a minute's silence and thought about the the sailors that died. It was a really beautiful day, no current, and you can see it absolutely stunning. So that was the wreath laying. Okay, next one. So this is what she looks like. Um, we'll go through a few a few slides of, of wreckage. And uh, you'll notice immediately, it's not like you would expect an intact wreck to be looking like, and that's how our Cape Town wrecks are, because our sea just takes them apart very quickly. That's the bowsprit, which is as substantial as you would think it would be. And then there's an anchor. You can't see it. I think that's it there. Okay, next one. The anchors were really um, the main sort of uh, uh, quite a big feature of the of the wreckage. There are two in the bow and a stern anchor as well. And you can see the anchor sticking out there. That's the bow sprit again. Ne the next one. Uh, this is kind of the main uh, highest part of the wreckage. It almost looks like reef, but it's it's actually part wreckage, part rock. And that is close to where there was a thing that looked like a flywheel and sort of bits of uh, what must have been a bit of uh, deck machinery, like a capstan or something like that. Next one. Uh, and there's the, that's the bow anchor again with the, 
one of the bow anchors with the bow sprit. Next one. And here's, you can kind of see here's the, the iron ribs and some iron plating left in places like that. But you, I mean, there's a lot of sand and obviously quite a lot of it is, is, is buried in the sand. Next one. So this is, um, this is on a day with good viz. And I just wanted this slide to indicate what we really wanted to do was do a kind of photo survey where you would, well, first thing you'd need to do is cut off all the kelp, uh, cut it and let it, let it drift away so that you're only looking at wreckage and then swim over the wreck uh, on a line. You could maybe even lie, lie a line on the bottom that you, the diver could follow, be about uh, 10 or 12 meters above the wreck and take photographs and then you could digitally stitch them together and you would end up with a beautiful, uh, there are programs that do that, they sort of match points and so on, pull it all together and you would end up with a picture of what she looks like. But we never got to do that. I think, you know, that would take quite a lot of time. You need, you need really good viz for that. And so we never got to do it, but it would be really the ideal wreck to do that sort of, uh, that sort of survey. Okay. That's probably the nicest photo of the of the wreckage because it's got the big anchor and it's got Jenny swimming up there. That's that's oh, Olivia's oh. photo. That's I think the nicest one of the of the photo. So then we get to uh, the gold coins in the in the in the captain's strong box. Where would that be? So obviously this is the bow, uh, the bow spread lying over there, bits and pieces. Stern anchor, the capstan, that flywheel. I think the captain's cabin would have been kind of at the back here somewhere. And the box is probably under the sand. So now you've got to start, you know, what are we going to do? If you're after the gold. So to move sand away at about that depth, a few things you can do. You can start with something like this. This is a six inch airlift and it would be powered by a compressor kind of like that or maybe a bit bigger the air goes into the front over there and then as it expands up that six inch uh, hose it uh, it draws water with it and creates suction and there you go you're you're moving sand the sand just obviously squirts out on the on the open end of the of the um, six inch hose and that is unfortunately ineffective at that sort of depth. You, um, you need actually a bigger compressor and only, you've only got also one person that can work at a time. And with a, 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 a wreck like that where you've only got limited time, you actually need, well, what you need is this. You need a whole lot of these, about six of them, smaller, two, uh, four inch nozzles and a massive dredge pump which would be on a much bigger boat, that boat over there. Then you, so that goes on there, you connect up, it goes to a manifold, and then you've got six divers all working, moving sand away, and you could clear all that sand off the wreck uh, in just a few hours and find whatever's to be found. Okay, next slide. Um, just, uh, I'm very thankful to all the divers that that helped me in the search over the years. You know, it's, it's like, what did we say, 11 years of, of diving there. So let's just run through their names. They're kind of in the order that they got involved in diving there with me. So Anton Brusso was the number one brass spirit in the old days. Mike Mennett was my dive buddy. I dived. Gavin Flook. Adrian Johnson, he's here. His wife, Jenny J. Terry Lee was there quite a few times. Peter Gordon, I think uh, three or four times. And he's Dive buddy Jeff Corbett, Ivan Napoleon was there, Graham Heiberg, Peter then started diving with me. So that was uh, fairly early still. Uh, Wilhelm von Sale dived, Mauro in Trona, um, our dive buddy who, who unfortunately died a few years ago. He got into the, the history and the wreckage and he actually went with me to Jean Tresfant's house when we were looking at the, at the mag uh, area and uh, he asked me to go out there to do a side scan survey because he thought we'd find it and he had his own idea of where she lay and so on. He really got into the history and, and, 
and the search, he was really into it. And it's a real pity that we found her only after he had died. Uh, Matthew Melodonis, he was a big time searcher, his wife Megan, Brian Murray, Dave Land. Uh, Dave Land, interesting guy, he'll be in the next photo, we'll talk about him in a sec. Martin was with us, Martin Evo, Rachel Browning, Jacques Livingston Lowe, and Quinton Quitzer. I, I may have, uh, I may have left some people out, I'm sorry if I, if I did, of the search diving. Uh, okay, next slide. So, uh, this is some of the guys. Um, now the whole thing about going out to do the sort of search diving is you've got to keep it fun. You, you can't be having a whole day out there just focused on just swimming lines and endless lines. And you, you've got to be, you know, it's got to be social. You're doing it on a nice day. You're going to stop if you see dolphins and you're going to basically make it pleasurable for everybody. Otherwise, you're going to end up doing it all by yourself. So you can see they're not having a bad time. <laughs> Dave Land, uh, I think Cape Town's oldest remaining Diver will be celebrating 50 years of diving in Cape Town pretty soon. And some pretty awesome wreck dives in that 50 years. And we're going to do something for Dave. Now just watch my, watch the space. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. So here's the, uh, some of the stats. Um, we did four days of diving the wreck prior to starting to look for the, for the Star of Africa. That was in the Pisces dive charters days with my previous boat, which was the Big Blue. We did one side scan survey trip. That was Mara's uh, idea. Then we did seven uh, search days with multiple divers, multiple dives. And that was all between January 2010 and the 5th of uh, September 2015, which is when we found her. And we've been there six times subsequent to, to finding her from uh, October 2015 to August last year. So that's a total of 17 days of diving, approximately 150 individual dives in 16 years. So when you look at, when you look at, you can't go there that much. That, you know, that's uh, 17 days out there in 16 years. That's averaging like one a year. And that is, is the difficulty with getting out to these extreme places. The conditions, to get the conditions matching the tide and the diver availability and the boat availability and nobody being sick, you know, it's not that often that it happens. Next one. So that's the end of the, of the story of the search for the Star of Africa. Thank you for, for watching. Cool.